Donald Trump has held an advantage over Joe Biden in our polling average since September of last year. If the election were held today, Donald Trump would not only likely win the national popular vote, but he would almost certainly secure a resounding electoral college victory, as he also leads in each of the critical battleground states. Now, obviously the 2024 presidential election will not be held today, or tomorrow, or even three months from now. And historical trends suggest that incumbents tend to rebound from less favorable early polling averages as we get closer to election day. With that in mind, let's take a look at a hypothetical 2024 electoral college map if Joe Biden receives a similar incumbency boost as previous presidents. My name is Ryan Guest, Elections Data Fellow here at DDHQ. Please make sure to subscribe to our channel below for more 2024 election analysis videos. As always, these thought exercises in no way, shape, or form represent official forecasts by Decision Desk HQ. They are merely hypotheticals. Hope you enjoy. Now, according to the latest polling average from Decision Desk HQ and The Hill, former Republican President Donald Trump leads incumbent Democratic President Joe Biden by 0.8% in a head-to-head -head race, and by 1.8% when including independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Although there is a long way to go before November, these numbers suggest that the 2024 presidential race is undeniably competitive, with Trump slightly favored in the national popular vote at this very moment, though his lead, as it stands right now, is hovering around the narrowest it has been since January, as Biden has enjoyed a decent bump in both head-to-head -head polling as well as his own job approval rating. With that being said, the important takeaway from these polls is not necessarily who is leading, or which candidate is up or down compared to the previous week, but that the election is close in the first place. Given that the latest average has Trump ahead by no more than a percentage point, the only thing we can say with absolute certainty is that the race to 270 electoral votes this November will be close. Anything beyond that is purely speculative, and no better than a prediction. In fact, G. Elliott Morris recently conducted an analysis of 538's extensive polling dataset going all the way back to the 1940s, and he found that polls from mid-March have missed the final outcome of the presidential national popular vote by an average of about 8 points. In the 1980 election cycle, for instance, incumbent Democratic President Jimmy Carter was ahead of Republican Ronald Reagan by 14 percentage points. But on election day, Carter ended up losing by 10 points. That was a 24-point error. In 1992, the early polls were off by 19 points, in 1972 by 12, and in 2000 by 8. Morris did note, though, that as voters have become more partisan over the last two decades, their votes have also become more predictable, thereby potentially making early polls more reliable as well. At this point in the 2020 election cycle, 538's polling average hit Biden leading by 3.8%. He ended up winning by 4.5%. That's a miss of less than a point. And in 2012, polls this early overestimated Barack Obama's margin over Mitt Romney by just 3.5 points. It may also be argued that given the 2024 election will indeed be a rematch of the 2020 race, polls assessing public opinion of Trump and Biden could be more set in stone than in previous elections with one or two fresh faces. Still, it's reasonable to say that our current polling average favoring Trump over Biden by 0.8% is unlikely to wind up being the exact final popular vote margin once all of the votes are counted. And we can also safely assume that the polls across different states and regions will generally miss in the same direction. So it's likely that the current polls are either overestimating or underestimating Biden by a few points. The incumbent president's critics have noted the former president's tendency to overperform his polling numbers. Trump outperformed 538's final polling average by two points in 2016, and then almost four points in 2020. On the other hand, Biden's supporters, including his own campaign team and advisors, have publicly downplayed these early polling numbers and suggested that once voters tune into the race down the line, they'll remember why they voted for him over Trump in 2020. And there is actually some evidence for this view. Early polls have consistently underestimated incumbents in the 21st century. 
For example, six months out from Election Day in 2004, presumptive Democratic nominee John Kerry was tied with then-incumbent Republican George W. Bush, drawing 47% each, according to Gallup's presidential heat trial tracker. But Bush, as we know, went on to win that election, securing a 2.4-point national popular vote victory. So, the difference between the polling average six months out from the 2004 presidential election and the final polling vote margin was 2.4% in favor of the incumbent, Bush. Then, eight years later, on May 6th of 2012, six months out from that year's election date, Democratic President Barack Obama led Republican nominee Mitt Romney by an average of just 1.2%, according to Real Clear Politics's polling average tracker. Obama ultimately defeated Romney by 3.9% in the national popular votes, a 2.7-point improvement over that early average for him. Most recently in 2020, then-incumbent Republican President Donald Trump trailed then-Democratic nominee Joe Biden by 5.8% on May 3rd of that year, according to 538's comprehensive polling average. Yet Trump only lost by 4.5% when all of the votes were counted. That means that Trump improved on his early average by 1.3%. And notably here, Biden was actually leading Trump by double digits over the final months of 2019, and often led Trump by a wider margin than just 5.8% throughout 2020 as well. All things considered though, in these three elections, the incumbent president's final popular vote margin averaged just over 2% higher than what polls had predicted six months before the election. This trend can partially be attributed to the phenomenon where poll respondents simply want to express their dissatisfaction with the current president's performance or the country's direction more broadly, be it due to economic conditions, a divisive issue, or generally negative media coverage. However, as election day nears, these same respondents, now voters, face a definitive choice between the incumbent and his challengers. It's one thing for voters who had previously supported the incumbent to consider a challenger months before the election, but it's quite another to actually hold a ballot in hand and vote against that incumbent on election day. This is especially true in an era where the vast majority of Americans base their voting decisions on their partisanship, which may be even more pertinent in 2024 given that these voters are faced with the same choice they made four years prior. Within the context of the 2024 rematch, specifically, Joe Biden's approval rating throughout his first term has often been the lowest for any president in modern American history. Yet it is also true that Donald Trump was historically unpopular himself throughout his first term in office, and continues to be viewed unfavorably by a majority of the electorate. As the election draws nearer, voters will be faced with a consequential decision between these two former opponents, potentially benefiting Biden as voters will be comparing him not to a new, fresh-faced Republican candidate, but to Trump's previous term. With all of this in mind, let's proceed with this hypothetical analysis of the 2024 Electoral College map, just as we did in our last video assessing what the map would look like if Donald Trump won the national popular vote by his peak polling lead over Biden, we'll adjust the latest polling averages in competitive states by a hypothetical shift in the national votes compared to 2020, and then further adjust each state's margin based on its relative trend between the last two elections and the state's elasticity score. As Donald Trump currently leads Joe Biden by 0.8% in the national popular votes, and the incumbency boost we have observed over the last three elections has been 2.13% on average, the projected national popular vote margin in this hypothetical becomes Biden plus 1.3. That would indicate a 3.2 point shift in the national environment since 2020 in favor of Trump, as Biden won the popular vote in 2020 by four and a half points. And so that becomes the projected national shift you see in this column here, which has been adjusted based on each state's elasticity score to produce the shift in this column. A state's elasticity is a measure of how responsive it is to national trends. A very elastic state is prone to big shifts in national voter preferences, while inelastic states don't move as much. For example, the elasticity score for Iowa is 1.13. This means that for every one point that the national political mood moves towards a party, 
the state of Iowa is expected to move 1.13 points towards that party. Another factor I have added in is the relative shift of each state between 2016 and 2020. After all, each state's politics and associated trends are unique. The relative shift indicates how the state shifted between those elections compared to the national shift. Take Nevada, for example. Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden both won the Silver State by 2.4 percentage points. However, since the national popular vote went from D plus 2.1 in 2016 to D plus 4.5 in 2020, Nevada's relative shift was actually 2.4 points towards Republicans. This means that even though Democrats won Nevada by the same margin in both elections, the state became more Republican compared to the rest of the country, since the national vote became more Democratic. Ultimately, I have added that relative shift and the adjusted national shift to the 2020 election result in every state, producing the margins in this column here. Negative numbers indicate pro-D margins, as you can tell by the colors, whereas positive numbers are pro-R. Now to be clear, this is by no means a comprehensive method of election forecasting. There are several other data points that influence election outcomes. But as I said at the start of this video, this is simply a thought exercise, and one that hopefully sheds light on some of the trends we may be seeing. Jumping over to the map now, let's go through each of the competitive states and congressional districts that were decided by a margin of less than 10 points in the 2020 election by order of adjusted margin. As you can see here, Joe Biden starts out with an early lead in the race to 270 electoral votes, with 209 to his name. Trump trails with 125. Starting in the Midwest, both Iowa and Ohio went to Trump by 8-point margins in 2020, but in this scenario they go from likely Republican to safe Republican, with the adjusted margins in both states jumping up to Trump plus 12, off the back of that Trump plus 3.2 national shift, and given that they both shifted in favor of Trump relative to the nation between 2016 and 2020. Up in the Northeast, Maine's 2nd Congressional District will join them in the safe Republican column, going from Trump plus 7 in 2020 to Trump plus 11 in this scenario. And then down in Florida, it almost goes down as safe Republican, as the margin goes from R plus 3.4 to R plus 9.7, a 6.3 point improvement for Trump with a 3 point national shift, and the fact that Florida shifted 4.5 points in favor of Republicans relative to the nation in the 2020 election, Florida will be likely red on this map, as will the state of Texas, which goes from Trump plus 5.6 to Trump plus 8.2. On the other side now, in favor of Joe Biden, Maine's statewide contest will go down as likely Democrat. So will Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District, and even the states of Virginia, and New Mexico also go blue. That's because their 2020 margins of D plus 11 and D plus 10 drop below double digits to D plus 7.4 and D plus 8.8. .8. Virginia's decrease is noticeably smaller than New Mexico as it ranks as the second least elastic state in the nation, and it shifted 2.5 points in favor of Biden between 2016 and 2020 while New Mexico is in the top 15 most elastic states and has flatlined between those elections. Up in Maine now, it is the fifth most elastic state, but it shifted 3.7 points towards Biden, which means it only goes from D plus 9 to 7.8 in spite of the national 3-point pro-R shift. As for the lean Democrat states, the state of Minnesota is Biden plus 6, down a point from Biden plus 7 in 2020. And New Hampshire is D plus 6.3, also down a point from Biden plus 7.4 in 2020 as well. And so that leaves the seven key battlegrounds of Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. All seven were decided by less than three points in 2020, and are expected to hold the keys to the White House again this November, with 93 electoral votes between them and the race to 270 still far from decided. Let's go rapid fire here. Five of these states will lean in favor of Trump. They are North Carolina at R plus 4.4, Wisconsin at R plus 3.4, Nevada at R plus 2.7, 
Pennsylvania at R plus 2.3, and then finally Arizona at R plus 2.2. That lifts Trump up to 281 electoral votes above the magic number 270, meaning that if he does indeed hold North Carolina and flip the rest of these, he wouldn't even need Michigan or Georgia, though he will still get them in this scenario. Michigan will tilt Republican at Trump plus 0.1, and Georgia at Trump plus 0.5, raising Trump's grand total to 312 electoral votes to Biden's 226. So, in this hypothetical scenario where we do grant Joe Biden a similar incumbency boost to the previous three presidents running for re-election, he would still lose to Trump by a convincing electoral margin. This further emphasizes the suggestion that Biden will likely need to win the popular vote by at least three points, if not four points, to have a shot at winning the Electoral College. Keep in mind that even in this scenario where he does receive that incumbency boost, his 1.3 point national win would be almost a full point lower than Hillary Clinton's two point popular vote win in 2016. And remember that she lost that election with less than 230 electoral votes as well. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you think of this method, and let us know if there are any other scenarios you would like to see us explore in future videos. That is all for today's video though, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to click that like button below if you did indeed like it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also check out more content from our channel here, and we'll catch you next time.